Okay, let's go ahead and get started on part two. The State Board of Accounts not only audits all the governmental units um, in the state, but we also prescribe the accounting forms that you use. And the statute actually calls for that, that we prescribe the accounting system. So those forms that we've generated are called prescribed forms. Uh, what you see on the screen is uh, the first page from chapter one of our accounting manuals, and it discusses what a prescribed form is, um, how you get one, what you do with it, that kind of thing. So we're going to discuss uh, several forms that apply to fire departments today and, and how they're used, the, those prescribed forms. An alternative to a prescribed form can be approved by the Board of Accounts, but it would have to include basically the same type of information. So the prescribed forms we're looking at are all hand-posted forms, like a receipt, for example. Uh, if you have a computerized accounting system that will generate a similar form or a receipt, once you enter the information into a computer and it spits it out, uh, you can get that form approved during an audit. Um, like I said, it would basically have to have the same information, the, uh, who it's received from, the date, the type, that kind of thing. Uh, but you can get something approved if you don't use the actual hard copy form. So you want to talk with the fiscal officer at your unit. Uh, they may know more about getting a form approved or if you read through the um, chapter one, this page that you're seeing on your screen and the subsequent page, um, that will give you more information too. So we hope after this part of the session, you'll have a better understanding of what forms and records are to be used and the procedures to be followed in the bookkeeping section of your department. Now we know the overall function of your department is not bookkeeping, but rather public safety. So we wanna make sure the bookkeeping part is easier so you can concentrate on protecting your communities and not have to worry too much about using the correct form or how to pay for supplies or things like that. So what we're going to cover, uh, there are several topics in this area, including um, an accounts payable voucher. That's one form. It also is called a claim, or it was called a claim many years ago, and then they changed it to accounts payable vouchers, or APV. Sometimes you'll hear APV, a voucher, and claim all used interchangeably. We're also going to talk about uh, payroll vouchers, service records, mileage claims, purchase orders. We'll also talk about some budget classifications uh, before we get into receipts. Probably after the budget classifications is when we'll take our next break. Um, again, as I mentioned in part one, the format that I'm using to record all of this, you know, the longer it goes, the more difficult it becomes. So I'm trying to, to break this up into different sections. Um, so that A, I'm sure that it records okay, and B, going between the different parts will give you a chance to maybe ask some questions locally where you're watching this uh, with anybody that might be in the room with you. So let's take a look at the first form. Again, it's that accounts payable voucher or the claim form. This is the initial document used to get the ball rolling for paying a bill. This is what the front of the form looks like it's a it has a front and a back this is what the back looks like the law govern governing the payment of claims can be found in indiana code 5 11, 10. the law requires all claims to be fully itemized before the fiscal officer your clerk treasurer your city controller or or another treasurer uh, can pay them it also requires there be a sufficient appropriation balance and a cash balance. Appropriation is a, just another term for budget. Uh, there has to be a sufficient budget balance in order to spend it. There also has to obviously be enough cash in your account or in that fund. And so keep in mind that there is a difference between cash and an appropriation. The appropriation is just the authority to spend a certain amount of money. And the cash is obviously the cash that you have available to spend it. The accounts payable uh, voucher also has to be filed and allowed generally with the board that oversees 
finances. So in a city, it might be a board of public works. It could be the city council in a town. It could be the town council, or it could be both in some cases. For a fire district, it's your board of trustees. So the clerk treasurer or the controller or the fiscal officer is also going to audit each claim for correctness. And the government official or the person receiving the goods or services that you're paying for must also approve it and certify that they've been received. On the front page of the form is the itemization section. The description section can be filled out detailing the purchase or the invoice or the paid receipt can be attached. That's probably our preferred method is that if you have a receipt, just attaching it to the claim, physically attaching it to the claim. And that way that information is all right together to review. Toward the bottom of the voucher, Below the itemization section is the certification where the department head or the person receiving the goods or services must sign and date the form. The person um, doing that could initial or sign the invoice. We've seen that before and we've not taken exception to it, uh, but there should be some indication somewhere that if you ordered a thousand widgets from some company, when those widgets come in, you, you check them, yeah, there's a thousand there, and then you're signing the claim stating that you have received those things and it's okay to go ahead and process the payment. Be sure to submit your uh, vouchers, your claims timely. You don't want to get your city or town to incur late charges or penalties because the, uh, the claim didn't get paid on time because you forgot to um, send a voucher and invoice to be processed. So make sure that you, you do those, get that information to your fiscal officers as quickly as you can. There are two statutes, um, one for cities, which is Indiana Code 364814, and one for towns, which is 365412, that allow um, the fiscal officer, your city controller, or your clerk treasurer to pay certain types of claims prior to a board meeting if your council has passed an ordinance authorizing that practice. So if your city or town has such an ordinance, the fiscal officer can pay the types of bills listed in the ordinance upon receipt. Uh, you won't have to wait until the next council or board of works meeting before the bill can be paid. It can be paid at the time it's presented, then, get, then it gets approved at the next meeting. So in those statutes, it lists some specific things that can be paid in advance if you have this ordinance in place. For example, uh, purchases from the United States government, you can pay those right away licenses or permit fees, utility payments. That's probably the biggest one. Your electric bill comes in and it's due maybe in 10 days, but your next meeting to approve such a payment isn't going to be for, you know, two weeks. So instead of um, holding on to that, not paying it by the due date, you can go ahead if you have this ordinance in place for a city or town and pay it. And then your governing body would approve it at the next meeting. And also, uh, the statute also lists a couple of other things. And the last one it lists says any expenses described in an ordinance. So when your city or town is passing this ordinance to allow you to pay these things, if there's some other type of um, reoccurring expense that it would benefit if you could get that paid as soon as possible, they just have to describe that in the ordinance. So I'm not sure uh, how many of you with cities and towns are aware of whether this ordinance exists or not. So you can get with your clerk treasurer or your controller and, and ask if you have those types of things so you can make sure and get those uh, paid right away. If you don't have one, um, if your city or town doesn't have that ordinance, consider getting with council and asking them if they would consider adopting such an ordinance. Again, for cities, it's Indiana Code 364814. And for towns, it's 365412. We're not, unfortunately, aware of any such provision for a fire district to pay something in advance. So if you're a fire district, technically you would have to wait for that electric bill, for example, until your next meeting and it gets approved before it can be paid. So if you, if you run into... A lot of um, circumstances where things are getting paid late, you know, maybe you could consider your board of trustees at a fire district meeting more frequently. Maybe they only meet once a month 
Maybe they need to meet every couple of weeks just so that they're able to approve claims. The next form we're going to talk about is the payroll schedule and voucher. It is prescribed form number 99. You'll see at the top of most of our prescribed forms in the corner, it will list the form number and the date that it was either prescribed or sometimes they have been revised over the years. It will have the revision date. And in the left-hand corner, usually it will say prescribed by the State Board of Accounts. So this is the front side of the form. Uh, if you've got a packet of materials, this page has this, your materials has this page in it, plus a couple of extras, which are the back side of the document. So again, this is the prescribed form. Uh, however, many computerized uh, systems have this information in a different form or a different report. A lot of those systems have payroll information included in them. So uh, this information is being captured. So that report that your system puts out would be sufficient as long as the uh, form or the report's been approved by the Board of Accounts, like I mentioned earlier. And to do that, it would basically have to have the same kind of information, and then we would review that uh, during an audit. The Form 99 that you have in your packets is what we what would be used in a hand-posted system. Not many communities use hand-posted systems anymore. Most are the computerized. Since there are several different computer vendors out there producing different reports, the easiest way uh, to dis discuss today um, to go over the hand-posted form. So whether you're using the Form 99 or a computerized system, the information necessary is still the same. The front side of the form is where a city or town department lists the employees to be paid and the time for which they are being paid. On the back side of the form is where the department head needs to sign that each employee actually worked the hours or days shown on the front side of the form. This form is similar to the accounts payable voucher in that it's the documentation necessary for checks to be written. The employees are detailed, much like an invoice for supplies would be detailed on a claim. And the certifications are necessary from the department head and the, the controller, the clerk treasurer. We get a lot of questions about showing salaried officers on this form. It is necessary to show each officer and their time to work. So even if they're salaried, they have to be included on this. This documentation is what your fiscal officer needs to be able to issue the check per Indiana Code 51110 that we talked about earlier. Also on the back side of the form is a place for the governing body to sign as approved. However, most uh, bodies, your councils, your board of works, uh, use what is referred to as a claim docket or a claim register. That's a listing of all claims, payroll or accounts payable um, to be listed so that they only have to sign their name once, uh, thus approving the disbursement listed. There are some boards out there that like to sign each individual payroll claim or each individual accounts payable voucher. That's fine too, but you can also use um, the DACA or the claim registered to list all of them out. So if you've got 100 checks to be written, you got 100 claims for a meeting, those will all be listed out on this claim register and the board will just sign their name at the bottom of that register instead of signing all 100 of those claims. Uh, next is the employee service record, prescribed form 99A. Again, this is what the form looks like in a hand posted system. Most computerized systems, again, have the same information on the report that looks a little different than this. But this record is maintained for each employee. It's either kept in your office or with the fiscal officer. That's kind of up to the fiscal officer. Uh, in my experience, I've, I've seen it more often than not maintained in the fiscal officer's office, uh, but I have seen it sometimes in the department. So like the fire department of the city might keep it and report to the clerk treasurer or the city controller, uh, but most often this type of information is kept with the fiscal officer. This form shows whether the employee worked on a particular day and how many hours they worked, or whether they were on vacation, sick, or other type of leave. 
Most of your people are going to be subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act, which requires records to be kept of the hours worked each day. Also, Indiana Code 51194 requires detailed time records. It states records to be maintained showing which hours were worked each day by officer and employees. So it's similar to what we discussed on the payroll voucher. Uh, this form is required even for salaried employees because the basic premise is if you're being paid, you're either A, working hours, or B, using some type of accrued leave benefit, like a vacation or a sick day. And this is a form that tracks that information by employee. As for overtime, if you ever have questions about that, we're going to direct you uh, first to your city or town uh, personnel policy or other such policy that addresses overtime. You can, like when is overtime being paid? Is it time and a half? Is it some other rate? That's those types of things. And next, we're going to recommend that you contact the experts on overtime, uh, which wouldn't be us, but rather would be the Indiana Department of Labor. And their phone number is 317-232-2655, or you can go to their website, which is in.gov slash DOL. With public safety officials, there are different rules in the Fair Labor Standard Act on overtime hours and when they kick in and because shifts, you know, particularly for fire departments can be 12 hour shifts and 12 hours off and, and that kind of thing. So you, you want to make sure you contact the Department of Labor so you can find out more information and the right procedures for overtime. Next up is the mileage claim. It's general form one. One. This is the form that you're going to use when you're claiming mileage reimbursement for using your personal vehicle at a drive somewhere on official business. This is the front of the form, and then this is the back. Same basic information as the other forms used to generate payments. This form asks for dates beginning and ending locations, the odometer reading, the reason for the trip, the number of miles traveled, and the amount being reimbursed. Also, there are places for the employee to sign, the fiscal officer to sign, and the governing body to approve by signature. Your city or town or fire district should already have an established rate per mile that you're gonna reimburse at if you reimburse for the personal use or the use of your personal vehicle. This should be in a travel policy that's adopted by your governing body. Uh, my experience is most units uh, use the federal reimbursement rate, which can vary from year to year. Now, I've seen other units use the state rate, what state employees get reimbursed at, which is currently 38 cents a mile. Uh, the most important thing here is that the rate be established in an ordinance or a policy approved by council. As it's designed, uh, if you're traveling within your city or town, you're going to use the odometer readings on the vehicle to track the number of miles traveled. If you're traveling from one city to another, the distance on an official highway state map can be used. But be sure to check with your clerk treasurer on what they expect. I've seen some insist that that odometer reading always be used, uh, some others not always. And be as descriptive on the form as you can. The, the from point and the to point should be very descriptive uh, for the clerk treasurer in order to give them the documentation they need to pay it and for the board of accounts to review it during an audit. Simply putting, for example, from Anderson to Indy and the number of miles isn't sufficient. Uh, that's because the distance from the center of Anderson to the north side of Indy is around 27 miles. But the center of Anderson to the southwest side of Indy can be, you know, closer to 50 miles. So we would prefer a street address to street address. And during an audit, that would be the easiest way to uh, verify the distance if a question were to come up. You can use uh, also like internet mapping, like MapQuest or Google Maps. Uh, what I would suggest there, if you're going to do that, if you're traveling from one city to another and you Google it to see what the 
the closest distance it is is to uh, print that off and attach it with your mileage claim. Um, that way the fiscal officer can see, okay, they went from point A to point B and it was 72 miles round trip. And they can look at your Google map and that, that should be close enough. We wouldn't question that during an audit. I mentioned in part one about our manuals and our quarterly bulletins that we publish. Uh, this slide is a copy from one of those bulletins uh, regarding travel expenses. It basically goes over some of the items I just touched on, but it goes in a little further detail. It discusses items to consider in a travel policy, um, like travel expenses, meals, uh, in travel status, uh, parking, tolls, uh, other incidental expenses. It covers um, per diem. Uh, you can be paid a per diem if that's in the travel policy adopted by your governing body of, of how much you're going to get a day for meals should also um, consider overnight travel, like how far away do you have to be for overnight travel in order to get a room? For example, state employees have to be at least 50 miles from their home in order to be to stay overnight um, for business purposes. A lot of travel policies don't <clears throat> always catch that. And I've seen cases where um, a unit that neighbors Marion County or, or is very close to Indianapolis and there's a conference in Indianapolis an employee from that unit spends the night and, and maybe it's a 15 minute drive. Um, and whether or not the governing body intends for employees at that unit to be able to spend the night on such a close distance, uh, we can't determine during an audit if it's not part of a policy. So keep those kind of things in mind because if you don't have it in there and somebody ends up spending the night at 15 minutes away, and, you know, maybe that's an expense your unit didn't have to incur and it can create issues. So keep those kind of things in mind. Next, we're going to talk about general form number 98, which is the purchase order. Not everybody uses this form. Um, we would recommend that all units use it. But if you're not using it, you don't normally take exception to the fact that you're not using it. So one of the things that you can do is find out if your fiscal officer, your clerk treasurer, your city controller has this form in place, because if you're going to be purchasing something, you're going to need to fill out a purchase order at some point. They are a good tool to use. Um, it helps you keep uh, track of your spending within a budget if you use it properly. If it's used in a city or town, uh, the form should be used for all purchases. You can use a blanket purchase order, maybe for a store where you buy many small, small items. Uh, your council or your governing body would set the amount of the blanket purchase order. Like if you have to run to the, um, the store to buy certain types of supplies, like screws or nuts or, or something for your items, for your general repairs or something, uh, you can have a purchase order, say, up to $1,000 that's approved by your governing body, then you could go and purchase off of that purchase order amount until you get up to the $1,000. And say if it's only August and you've met that $1,000, then your council can approve another purchase order for maybe another $1,000 to get you through the end of the year. But you can do purchase, you can do blanket orders. You'll notice at the bottom of the form, the controller or the clerk treasurer has to certify that there is an appropriation balance uh, sufficient to cover the purchase. So when you get back to your cities and towns or your fiscal officers, you want to talk to them about the purchasing policies or procedures that they have in place. If you don't use purchase orders and you see that you're having trouble running out of appropriations, um, like in September or October, you might want to consider starting using those to help track that as you go along. Uh, the, the clerk treasurer or your fiscal officer is tracking that each time purchase is made, but this will help you um, know what your appropriation balances are and, and help you track that as you go along as well. The next couple of pages in, in your materials, if you have them, are budget classifications that are used in most cities and towns. 
They relate closely with the budget forms required by the Department of Local Government Finance or DLGF when preparing your budgets. You'll most likely get involved with that during the summertime when you're preparing your budgets for the next uh, calendar year. There are four major, major budget classifications uh, listed with detailed explanations of each minor budget classification. The four major ones are personal services, supplies, other services and charges, and capital outlay. You can read in your materials what the definitions mean. Uh, basically, personal services would be salaries, wages, and benefits. Supplies is pretty obvious as well. It's broken down into office supplies, operating supplies, repair and maintenance. There are several subcategories and other services and charges. Uh, professional services, um, what a fire department might encounter would be legal fees or maybe computer service, professional service fees, printing, includes any printing or advertising that you might have to do for your department that would include the prescribed forms that we were talking about if you had to order those that could be paid out of printing expense insurance is another example uh, it would be any insurance except group health insurance so if you've got some kind of insurance to cover your department whether it's um, your vehicles or that kind of thing that can be paid out of the insurance line item Capital outlay would include uh, the purchase of any land, buildings, or equipment that was in excess of your city or town's established capitalization threshold. And what that means is, you know, each unit should have a dollar amount over which items are capitalized or considered a capital asset. Those are the items that are tracked normally by the fiscal officer and periodically inventoried. So each unit can be different. They can have different thresholds for different types of assets. Uh, computers, for example, might have a different threshold than um, other types of office equipment just because they, they can be expensive, but they might not be so expensive that you want to you know, keep track of all of them. So check with your fiscal officer. They're probably looking at claims as they come through and being paid for asset types of items and they are recording them, but check with them to see at least what your procedures are and maybe what your capitalization threshold is for paying things out of like capital outlay. A couple of other items before we end part two, uh, budget transfers. Since budgets or appropriations are basically estimates, uh, there will come a time when you'll need to make some transfers of appropriation balances. When you go from one minor budget classification or category to another minor category within the same major category, you may only need to issue the clerk treasurer or a controller a memo advising them to do so. But it depends on the policies in place at your unit. Uh, some cities require that all transfers go before council, for example, for approval. So even if you're within a major category like the supplies you need to move money from <clears throat> you need to move appropriations sorry from operating supplies to office supplies your council may want to know that they may want to approve that if not that can be done by the clerk treasurer just making that but um, it wouldn't necessarily need approval if you wanted to move it from supplies to other services and charges for example so from one major to another major, that definitely requires uh, you going before your council. And that has to be also done by your council uh, or your governing body through an ordinance or resolution. Grants, we get a lot of questions on how to handle grants. I think most of the grants you might see would be reimbursement grants. or Those are grants when the city or the town where the fire district expends money and is reimbursed by the grantor agency. Reimbursements may be appropriated by the 
governing body without using the additional appropriation procedures, which means that it doesn't have to go back through DLGF's approval. So <clears throat> you've got an appropriation set up in a line item and you spend that down or you reduce that, that budget when you're paying for things and because you know your grant is going to uh, reimburse you maybe three, four months later, you get that money comes back in, but you've already now you've got the cash, but you don't have the authority to spend it because you used it when you spent it in the first place. So what this is saying is for the statutory provision that um, your council can reappropriate that money, put it back in that line item because it's a reimbursement grant. You don't want to get dinged for using your appropriation balance in the first part of the year when you ended up getting reimbursed for it later on. Advanced grants are, are a little different for federal grants that are advanced or the money is giving to you first and then you go out and you buy new equipment with it. Um, there's no appropriation necessary for that. So the fact that the federal agency is giving you the money in advance, here's $10,000 to go buy some new uh, breathing apparatus. Um, as long as you go out and use that money on the breathing apparatus, you don't need an appropriation for it. If you happen to get a grant that includes both federal and state dollars, which happens a lot of the time, uh, an appropriation is necessary. And we've recommended that that grant activity be accounted for in a separate fund. So that's, again, something that your clerk treasurer or your fiscal officer will handle. Um, but just keep in mind, if it's a grant that includes federal and state dollars, it does need an appropriation. We get a lot of questions on insurance proceeds, and they're covered under Indiana Code 6-1.1-18-7. So if you have a, a vehicle, an ambulance, or your fire truck gets in a, an accident and it's wrecked, uh, this statute allows the fiscal officer to reappropriate the money received uh, from a person for damaged property as long as uh, your unit is going to repair or replace that damaged property within 12 months. So you don't have to go through the additional appropriations process here. In this case, you don't have to go back through council necessarily to uh, add this money back to the line item that you're going to make the repairs or the purchase of a new truck out of that can just be done under this statute by your fiscal officer. Just want to make sure, though, that those insurance checks, that money gets receipted in by your fiscal officer before they automatically add it back to the appropriation and you go out and spend it. All right, well, I'm just a little bit past a half an hour on um, part two, so that's kind of like where I want to cut off um, so that I make sure that this recording doesn't get uh, messed up in any other way. So we will go ahead and conclude part two and take a break. And again, if you need more refreshments or need to have a discussion with the group that's in your room, feel free to do so before you start part three. And I'll see you when we get to part three.